cost dynamics improve, he did uh, create a new approach to classification um, using ultra powers and extension theory, which, I mean, they were a bit known before by Kirchberg and such, but not really published in that versions as seen today. So um, I'll just briefly tell you exactly what Schaffhaus sort of accomplished in his F F and bidding paper and briefly the steps he goes through to do it. So um, in his F, F embedding paper, which was published back in 2019, announced in 2018, uh, here is a special case of his theorem because in his actual theorem there are about 50 assumptions or something. So I just took the easier one to make it more clean. Uh, given, so there's a lot of jargon in these sort of uh, classification um, statements. Let me just sort of pinpoint out what you should look at and not really be too worried about. So simple nuclear and separable, these are sort of standard assumptions in classification. These are the class which is data we're trying to understand. So that's, even though that's three words, meaning something, don't worry too much about it, standard assumptions. I use a T, don't worry too much about it. It's virtually any C starch will satisfy use of T you can think of. And it just controls the K theory and KK theory and connects them together. Um, so given this, you can actually, if you have a trace given, i.e. a tracial state, you can embed A into a unital simple AF algebra with a unique trace. So of course, you shouldn't worry about too much about the assumptions on the AF algebra, but you should just know it is AF. That's sort of the big thing here. And it's a very nice behaving AF with a trace that you can embed A into. And you could do this in a unital way. So I can unitally embed it, and I can do it in a trace recovering manner. What do I mean by trace recovering? I mean, if I have my embedding, it's called gamma from A into uh, my AF guy here. And there is a trace on my AF that's called B. Then, of course, uh, tau B gamma should be tau of A. That's just what I mean by trace recovering or trace preserving. So, uh, by the way, this is a real uh, Pimstein Voiculescu. The, the, the original uh, proof. It's uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I mean, you could view this as a sort of extension of the uh, Pimston work with SQF mm -hmm. embedding paper of the irrational rotation output. Yes. Yep. You could. I mean, the rational rotation output certainly matches into this situation, right? So. No, no, but also the proof itself. So Voiculescu's proof is uh, the way it's done. It's really. Uh, it's still using QCT, so it's really very similar. Yes, but I think the, techni the approach itself is different, I believe. Is it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, it'll pop up soon. Maybe you can clarify. I'm not too expert on the Pimston work with approach. Um, uh, Mika, like, uh, like Kang also has a question. Like, uh, so sure. is A unital? Like, is A unital? Uh, I, I mean, if A is unital, then B can be picked unital, yes. But you don't need unitality there. So the statement one should be reading like something. Yeah, like I mean, right, this just this just say unital here to be safe, and then say without unitality, I should remove the unitality assumptions. Okay. Uh, and the point two, that's just a uniqueness statement I mentioned earlier, right? That um, any two such embeddings, there is only one up to approximate unitary equivalence. That's just what bullet point two says. Kang, did it answer your question? Okay. Lovely. So that's just the, uh, that's the, it's a special case of Chris Schaffhauser because, I mean, in reality, he doesn't even assume nuclearity and he has a bunch of faithful amenable traces and exactness and such, but I just want to give this special case to make it more easy to read, I guess. Also, I wouldn't have to call, talk about quasi traces then. That's a bit of a nuisance. Um, so just as a corollary, there's the following theorem. If you pick a countable discrete group G, the reduced group C star bar, 
actually embeds into a universal UGF algebra if and only if G is amenable. So, I mean, by two right winter, we knew that uh, reduced group C star algebra is cross diagonal if and only if it's nuclear, if and only if the group is amenable. This is a strengthening. It's even AF embeddable into a very nice AF algebra, even. Maybe the nicest up there. Although, of course, it should be said that this embedding, Chris Alvarez, he, he uh, obtains through this down here, uh, you have no reason to believe how to track that embedding. You go through the bam Khan conjecture, you go through auto powers, you have no clue what that map looks like. And um, Mika, uh, can you explain, like, uh, can you hear me? Like, yeah, I can, I can. Uh, can you explain what is, uh, is there some, um, some benefit like uh, of having an AF, AF embedding? No, but I mean, well, I mean, AF embeddings were or have been sort of very open research for many years. I don't even know how far it goes back, but after the AF classification, I believe the work of Pimston Work Gulescu, where they embedded the, uh, uh, the irrational rotation algebra into AF and AF algebra, and so it sort of sparked a lot of research on how far can you go with AF embedding. Also, it has been sort of conjectured that if you take a cross diagonal separable exact cyst algebra, does it have to be AF embeddable? The converse is true. But it's wide open whether the whether um, cross diagonal sort of gives AF embedding and if they are parallel. So is it like seeing like AF embedding as some something like related to cross diagonality or yeah, yes, that's one of the at least historically motivating backgrounds. Okay, okay. Also, surprisingly, many C star algebras are, are if embeddable. Yeah. Any cone will be if embeddable. So. Okay. Did I answer all the questions for this? I think so. Okay. I'll just let's go on. So uh, now I gave you some of the films that Chris Alphas did. This is the big stuff. And what motivated my, the things I did in Glasgow and such. So let me just go into a bit more details on how we did it. For that, we need the devi a device called UltraPowers, which I believe people know by now, but let's just remind everyone what the idea at least is. So you fix the free ultrafilter on the natural numbers, I call it sub omega, and you pick some extremal trace tall. The extremal condition, I mean, we're going to work for unique trace, so just think about such a unique trace. And then we create two limit algebras, B sub omega here. You take all bounded sequences, L infinity of B, and you multiply up by all null sequences where the convergence goes along this ultra filter. That's B low omega, that's the norm ultra power here. The tracial ultra power, that's when you have a, the omega on the top. It's a bit confusing notation. You have to. <laughs> I mean, but I was confused the first time I had to read between these at least. Um, the difference is you mod out by the trace kernel, basically. So the two trace norm is just the semi norm induced by the trace. And of course, the purpose of doing all this B omega and such is you, instead of doing just the say B infinity, as is the classical, you actually get a genuine trace on B low omega. Namely, we can just take the limit, right? I can do, if I take a sequence of Bs in L infinity, I can just take tau omega on this to be the limit of my original trace on B of Bns. This gives me a genuine trace, which restricts the trace on B under the diagonal embedding. So I always have embedding here. Think of this as constant sequences. Okay, so probably have to remove this, otherwise I can't show more. And the whole idea of this trace, uh, this ultra power jargon is uh, we build an extension, namely the normal ultra power here, the tracial ultra power. You can prove there is a subjection here, trace preserving, and the kernel of this will be the trace kernel. So this is the notation for the error in of the trace you're on being faithful. And one of the extra benefits of having this is uh, what one essentially does is this one, B over omega, will be a two-one factor. 
when the trace is extremal. And this is a cistage bar. And somewhat, you can link the phenomenon realm to the star realm with an error of this trace kernel here. That's the moral, at least. And let me just give you a special case, which was used uh, back in 2015, 2016 on the cross-diagonal theorem. Namely, if you take B to be the universal Jeff algebra, this infinite tensor product, this extension as it takes this form. Q is just the norm order power, and R is the one and only separable high by finite to one factor. So that in particular, in this case, this R omega is a very um, nice behaving phenomenon algebra even. So, what, so I've just given you a lot of constructions here and you're probably familiar with them, but the whole point is just this middle extension. That's the big important thing. Understanding this is what sort of made Chris's techniques work. That you really don't need to understand this extension and more importantly, you need to understand this kernel here, this J sub omega. That's the crux of the what Chris does. Okay, well, let's just get some meter theorems out of the way for ultra powers because the purpose of going through all this ultra power stuff is uh, so I'm saying a meter lemma here is actually maybe about 50 lemmas or so combined. <laughs> but uh, the, the moral of these ultra powers is if you have a bunch of CP, CCP maps, phi one, phi two, from main to B with some approximate property, maybe they become more and more multiplicative as you go through the sequence. Then when you pass to the ultra product, you get a genuine star morphism or whatever approximate property you're given with. So something approximate turns into something exact. That's the moral. Um, and of course the extra benefit of this is, uh, imagine you had a bunch of CCP maps with some approximate properties. You can just take K theory onto this and expect a good group of morphism out of that. But if you pass to the ultra power, you can just by functionality of K theory, apply that and you get a group of morphism. So that's sort of K theory enters more cleanly in this way. Lowercase omega or uppercase omega? Oh, sorry, your microphone was a bit. Lowercase omega or uppercase omega? Uh, either. Yeah, well, that depends on the approximate property. If uh, if the approximate property, let's say they're more and more multiplicative, right? In norm, then you can be do lower omega. But if let's say they are um, more and more multiplicative in the two trace norm, then it would be upper omega. Upper, upper, okay, okay. So it depends on you know what norm you're picking. Um, is that is that also like uh, is that Kirchberg's epsilon test? No. Uh, yeah. So about most of these are due to Kirchberg's epsilon test. Yeah. Well, that's one method of proving it. So like that you get one map. No, it's marked perfect. No, no, I mean, I mean, the upper one here, or the two first bullets, that's just straight up, put them into, or define the map as, oh, the, okay, as, yeah. as the limit, straight up. But the uh, third bullet I have here, that's the epsilon test, for instance, yes. Yeah. For instance, we also have sort of uh, on, the, on maps that are already mapping into B omega. For instance, if I have a my bunch of maps phi and psi into B omega, Let's say they are proximal equivalent, then there are these reindex techniques to ensure they will actually be genuinely unitary equivalent. So just the more of the story is if you have anything approximate, there's a good chance you can make it exact when working with ultra powers. You should be careful, you can't always do it with every, every property out there, but most external approximation properties can probably be um, reindexed or done exact. Okay, so um, with this, these sort of meter ideas and ultra powers given the way, let me just give you the two steps that Chris Alphas does to prove that uh, first theorem I showed you before. He does it in two steps. First of all, he classifies, so you should be careful what I mean by classify, but I mean, you can lift a map from K theory to the C star level and you get some unique results along with that you can classify all trace recovering embeddings from A into the lower omega. That's what he actually classifies first. So all these embeddings, he classifies these. Having done that, having done bullet point one, you can actually lift these embeddings 
to almost embeddings into from A into B, low, A into lower B, just normal B, sorry. And you sort of glue these sequence of maps together to, to produce a genuine embedding from A into B. So bullet point two sounds technical. It is, but it's surprisingly easy. Surprisingly easy. So the big thing Chris did was actually bullet point one. That's actually where the hard work and labor comes into play. Because you can almost imagine if I have a, if I have a general map here, I can lift it to a map from A into infinity B. Could be by Troy Fus, for instance. And having done so, I just need to carefully pick Cauchy limits of my map, sequence of maps and they will work. So the bullet point one is definitely where the hard labor comes into. Play. And it's also what I would like to focus on today. So sort of this was what I had to do a lot of, of uh, study a lot of in uh, Glasgow and work with. Um, this careful picking of uh, Cauchy sequence, it's like, a, is it like using somewhat like a aseverable? Yeah, so ability comes into play and you, you carefully use these, uh, you know, ultra filter nonsense to sort of, okay, I can pick a set that for all instances, make sure I am close to this when I'm close to, well, when I'm far enough in my auto limit, so to say, I am, I'll get a good approximate versions and I pick a careful Cauchy limit. It's just hard to imagine that uh, to, to make it like, uh, like a start, to keep it as a star homomorphism. Yes, I mean, but it's, I mean, if you actually read in, a, in his embedding paper, which is the second last section, it's, it's surprisingly easy. Okay. Surprisingly easy, you, you'd be sort of, okay, that just worked. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised myself because I thought you would have to do a lot of gluing and functional calculus, but no, yeah. just straight up, you pick a nice limit. Be careful with that. I see, okay. Man. Right. So that's the uh, the motivating part of classification and why I am interested in maps from into B, the omega and their key. It's now been a bit vague. I've just given you a bunch of results and auto powers. Um, I'll give you another motivating example from where all this all these technique, techniques come from, and I'll in that way tell you how KK theory and X theory enters and why that's important to keep track of. So now we have to go through um, an ultra power formulation of two notions of traces, something called amenable traces and cross diagonal traces. So amenable traces have been, they are much older than cross diagonal traces. Cross diagonal traces are back from 2003 by Nate Brown and amenable traces that uh, traces back to Con and his high by finite traces, I believe they were called back then. But here's the C star version for amenable traces. I'm just giving the ultra power formulation to make everything conceptual. So a trace tor on A is at least if it's acceptable, it's amenable, if and only if I have a trace preserving map from A into R upper omega. And the trace is cross diagonal if I have such a trace preserving map from a into Q low omega. So you can definitely see the difference here, right? Amenable is a very phenomenon, algebraic notion. Uh, cross diagonal is a very star algebraic notion. Sense. Remember this is, and do remember that they are actually linked by an, ex an, a, an extension, right? So I have this, had this subjection here, right? E omega, which was trace preserving. Why well, at least I told you it's true. Mm -hmm. um, so given this extension, you can definitely say, well, any cross diagonal trace must be amenable to, right? I just apply this map. I'm good to go. And if A is exact, we can pick this gamma to be nuclear. But that's, and it's just to sort of emphasize that I have this exactness assumption going on through all my slides, uh, or a bunch of my slides. The only reason I need exactness is to keep track of nuclearity of my maps. There's no other reason to do it. Okay, so again, uh, let me just rephrase all traces on, or give you some remarks. Uh, if you take a nucleus to start from, all traces are amenable. And if you see newer papers, people seem to assume amenability of traces instead of nuclearity whenever they can get away with it. 
And in older papers, they just assume nuclearity because the notion of amenability seems to have been forgotten at some point or not really been popular. So, um, of course, all cross stacking traces are amenable by the idea I just gave before. And it should be known cross stacking traces are not rare. If you have any unital cross stack or C starch bar, it emits a cross stacking trace. So, these are just some small remarks on when can you expect these traces to pop up. So anything nuclear in infinite cross diagonal, you have these sort of traces. So they're not too rare, they're actually very common. Okay, so let me just give you the, the one and only big theorem that connects these two things, which is back from 2015 or published in 2016 and generalized by Gabe a bit, a bit afterwards. If you have, if you take any separable exact C algebra, A, and it has a faithful amenable trace, given the UCT, this trace is cross-diagonal. So you can think of this as an upgrading theorem, right? Given a faithful amenable trace with certain very modest assumptions on A, it can be upgraded to a cross-diagonal one. And um, the proof of this, or well, this was proved by T.W.S. White Winter back in 2015 slash 16, depending on when you if someone has proved it or published it. And Gabe generalized it a bit to include this amenable trace notion. But the proper and good proof is due to Chris Schaffer so about ha, one year afterwards. And the, the thing about what the approach that Chris did was actually to sort of review the proof. Because the idea is the following. You're given this phi, this trace preserving map from A into R upper omega, right? Which is trace preserving. And you need a star morphism psi, which is trace preserving from A into Q low omega. That's what you need to do to prove this theorem. And the proof itself is important. Because um, how can I review this? How can I rephrase what I have to do to, not to uh, get into the end game? Well, what I have to do is just make the pullback extension with respect to uh, pi omega and phi, and I get this diagram, which commutes. Now, let's imagine that this arbor extension split, i.e. I have some uh, star morphs in here, right? If, it, if that one splits, I am done, because I just go through this. So, I mean, and this is the, even an equivalent formulation. So I could ask myself, have I done things easier for myself? And yes, I have, because being split, i.e. that understanding when the other extension splits is a extension theoretic notion. This is very often when it, when, what happens when the X element vanishes. And that's sort of the starting point of what Chris does. And actually, if you're really careful, if you carefully read what in Chris's uh, new proof of the cross nine theorem paper, he proves the following. The trace that was amenable to begin with, this is cross diagonal if and only if that upper extension splits from the pullback, which happens if and only if that extension's element in X theory vanishes. This is, or, and I'm cheating a bit here because it's not exactly beta, on that extension he proves vanishes is a certain severable sub-extension, but they're yeah, long for now to get the idea. Uh, the, but the idea is just prove that this actually vanishes and then it's done after having proved this, of course. And the whole reason why this becomes zero is the only reason why the UCT enters. Because not only can you prove that uh, this extension exists, you can prove it actually lies in the kernel of the UCT map, which always exists. But modularly, but if you assume the UCT, this will be an isomorphism. And you can prove that uh, the class beta here vanishes on K theory, and so it vanishes here by the UCT map condition. So basically, and what I was kindly forced to by Stuart, back in Glasgow was to understand whether UCT condition is actually necessary because you don't need the full strings of the UCT, maybe, you just need injectivity of that map. Because this element is in the kernel of this, map, this guy here. So beta is in the kernel here. 
just needs I just need injectivity. Okay, and uh, so I was kind of asked by Stuart to understand this beta, or should maybe like sort of this obstruction to KK theory, right? Or to uh, quasi-active, sorry. This is just by the upper one here, that's the only thing that uh, makes a distinction from whether the trace is quasi-active or not, just whether or not that guy vanishes. And so I started to, by the, uh, and of course, you could rephrase this as a KK obstruction because there is an isomorphism from X to KK if you just take the suspension with first parity. Okay, and basically what I tried to do, or one of the things I was asked to do was try to understand if I could place this in a better spot. And I, it turned out I could replace the, one of the Ks with an L, And KL theory is something I'll talk about briefly. At least I'll compare it to KK theory. A lot of times to explain to you also why that's interesting. Also, also in terms of classification. Uh, but we'll get to that in next slide, I believe, uh, where things become become a bit more technical. So I think if you have any questions so far, this would be a good spot to ask them. Let's move on then. So I'll just give you guys one minute to read this slide because I am not going to read them out loud. <laughs> there are three equivalences on representations on A or B. So you will look at, uh, so this is a notion for all maps of this form up here. I'll just give you a brief time to look at these uh, uh, three notions, just quickly skip them. Because they look alike, they look a lot alike. Okay, I'll take a sip of my coffee meanwhile, I guess. So let me just give you some remarks after you read them. Um, these are three very similar notions. And if anyone of you have ever read the Wojcicki theorems, classical theorems of Wojcicki, you will realize that this is just based on that, right? You have this uh, approximate unitary equivalence or asymptotic unitary equivalence down here, and the differences have to be compact operators. At least if you think of this as a Hilbert module, right? Then this is the Adjoinables on the Hilbert module, and these are the callback ones on the Hilbert module. And um, of course, the distinction from the first one and the two lower ones is exactly the placement of the units, well, unitaries. So in the upper one, the unitaries are just unitaries on the multiplied bus. Down here, I demand they are actually on the unitization. And more, of course, the this one is just the approximate version, so that's just approximate, and this one is the asymptotic version. So these notions will pop up very often right now, so I hope you remember the, these three symbols a lot um, throughout. Because what they actually managed to do, or what Dalai's managed to do with the two lower notions is actually rephrase what KK theory is, and in a way that's very, um, amenable to classification and is very linked to KK and KL theory. So let me just try to erase this. Yeah. Okay, so a bunch more things. Um, first of all, there is the one and most important notion that uh, Chris Schaffer works with is this upper one that's called nuclear absorption. Which is actually a very old notion, but it has become very important recently. So I should have put this in a very nice box. Let me just really underline it to emphasize that this is important. Uh, nuclear absorption simply means if I have any 
weakly nuclear representation, so it's just a nuclear in a strict topology, then it absorbs this phi map. So phi plus my nuclear absorbent guy will just be my nuclear absorbent guy with respect to that first equivalent notion. And the purpose of nuclear absorption, you will see that very uh, concretely later, is it controls KK theory very well. It gives us a lot of control on it. And this is what we need later on. So first I need to tell you why this gamma map exists. And if you remember the few slides before, AQD trace maps and amenable traces, I call them gamma. So you should probably connect these two dots together by now. I think cross diagonality should probably give me this map and it will. But let me just first introduce you to what KK theory is and such. Um, so remember this nuclear absorption, it will come up later once we need to control KK theory. Uh, I hope you all know KK theory because I'm not going to prove anything about this guy. Uh, but I'm taking the Kuhn's pair picture. So Kuhn's pair is phi comma psi. Two, I'm assuming weakly nuclear throughout. Um, I have two weakly nuclear star morphisms, phi and psi from A into the multiple algebra stabilized. And the difference has to just belong to the compacts. And I just use this notion for all Kuhn's pairs. I think it's okay standard, I hope. And below, I'm giving you a definition, nicely boxed which is not really the original definition of KK theory, but it is what Dalat and I managed to prove. That if you have to take a separable A and a sigma until B, the KK theory here is actually just on Kuhn's pairs modulo this asymptotic approximate mutual equivalence I showed you before. And KL theory can be viewed as the approximate version. And you know, maybe notice I have this little gamma down here. That's because I have this approximate notion after adding my nuclear absorbing gamma here. And the choice of gamma is completely free. You can pick any nuclear absorbing you, you may wish to. So this free choice is actually going to be important later on because if we can build a nuclear absorbing guy with extra control, we can use that one. Okay. Miko? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, like, is it in some sense like uh, analogous, or at, at least uh, inspired by, um, like, where you start? Like, if you the the classical Kasparov's KK theory, where you start off with these um, homotopies, mm -hmm. I don't know, generalized homotopies, maybe called, or I don't know, um, like, and then like, uh, and then like this this little result that okay, that like telling like. Uh, modding out by homotopies is the same as like modding out by operator homotopies plus uh, degenerate cycles. Uh, no, this is this is much harder. This is a whole paper. But I mean, like, uh, like, like the, the analogy that okay, like replacing all like this this harder thing like uh, homotopy by something like degenerate, like in this case maybe like uh, absorbing. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you could view this uh, the. Uh... KK cycle page with you add a, a degenerate guy, then yes, you could view this as gamma as being a degenerate guy. Okay, okay. So because as such, such a nuclear absorbent gamma, if you look at the uh, gamma comma gamma class, it will often represent zero in KK theory. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, I mean, it is a, yes, yeah, you could use a gen degenerate thing, but I think it's more, it's better to view this as five psi are either asymptotic or approximate unitary equivalents, if and only if they are, or they are equal in KK or KL theory, if and only if they are approximate or somatically equivalent up to stabilizing by gamma. I have to add this very large gamma. Yeah, that, that's, like, this. that's like adding something um, like, like, for example, like Groton did, you know, like where you like add up like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this, it, is a stabili uh, so the, it is a stabilization sort of mm -hmm. summoned. Yes, it's very natural way of viewing it. Did anyone else have a, have a question so far? We're almost at a break. We just have to keep up a bit more. Okay. Uh, let me just erase this so we can actually see what's going on. Right. So before uh, slowly moving over to a break, let me just, so this is what, how I view KK theory and KL theory. KL is the asymptotic version. KK is the approximate version. 
so let me just tell you how Chris he actually uses this notion, sort of very briefly about how he actually does it. And I'll focus on the uniqueness part. So imagine you have two nuclear full star morphisms, phi and psi, from A into Q low omega. And they agree on, so that's pi omega, sub omega, I've forgotten omega. But they agree on traces, that's what this notion means. Right, so they agree when you apply the trace on Q omega. And imagine that K theory is the same. Just ordinary K theory, K, K, C room K1, no ordering needed. If so, the first thing he does is, uh, Chris, he realized that they actually induce a Kuhn's pair on A comma J omega. Notice this is J omega, Y and J omega. Well, that's the trace preservation, right? This means they agree modulo J omega. Okay, after having noticed that, he goes for the user T map. He says, well, they agree on K theory here. So if I push my Kuhn's pair and the class that induce on KK theory into my HOM set, they will be zero here, right? And if I assume use a T, well, it had to be zero in KK nuke, or just in KK theory over here to begin with. And having done this, we use the formal equivalence I told you to show that phi plus gamma and psi plus gamma would be uh, equivalent. Well, sorry, asymptotically, unitarily equivalent. And the last thing uh, Schaffer does is sort of destabilize. So tricky does to sort of remove the gamma summons. And now you have your uniqueness result that you need. And it does the same sort of ideas for lifting to general star morphism, but this is at least a uniqueness statement, which I think clarifies the idea very nicely. And you can sort of see this sort of the same idea that actually happens in the cross diagonal paper you lift along the UCT map and work in X theory from there. But you just know it vanishes in here, but you need it to vanish in here. That's the idea. Okay. So this is, this is Chris's, one of Chris's many approaches um, when he has to classify embeddings from A into B low omega. And so I want what I in extension to uh, the work I did in Glasgow, I actually asked the question, or Jamie asked me the question, can you prove that this is going to be the same as KL theory? So notice that I'm doing KK theory here, right? So I get my symptotic. But if I'm just looking for approximate versions, can I make do with KL theory? That would be a natural question to ask, especially because K, uh, approximate is something that's less greedy than asymptotic. Being asymptotic requires much more, right? And so just before giving you a break, uh, why KL theory? KL theory is the screen, as I just told you. And the reason is, I'm just black boxing a, thing, a few things here. Um, it is easier to lift maps long use T map going through KL theory. So I have a map here, usually called gamma for some reasons. And you may notice I have replaced KK by KL here. And doing so, you can replace the usual HOM set with something called total K theory and their particular morphisms. So total K theory, that is just the sum of K star of uh, my algebra with all torsion coefficients here. But, I mean, it is a larger invariant and the point is not that it's larger uh, because K, uh, total K theory can be completely computed knowing the K theory, but the morphism set is much larger. So imagine I have maps from K bar to K bar, then it's much easier to actually, there's more room to work with, there are more morphisms to work with. So it's morally at least easier to lift maps along this UCT map. That and the notion and the equivalence or equality in KL theory is approximate. So have, it should be easier to work with KL in classification, at least on a general level. But I mean, what Schaffer does is actually work with Q and Q is probably one of the nicest he starts out there, right? 
So that's just one of the, mot um, I know I'm being vague here, but that's one of the motivating reasons. Kale theory is, morally speaking, more reasonable to work with if you want to classify things in diphthomorphisms. Questions so far? Or was I suggest we take a coffee break? Miguel, uh, can you tell like what is the, what goes into the proof that into destabilizing? Um... Yes, I can. I will do that after the break. Okay. So yes, because I mean uh, this destabilization process, this word here, is exactly the technique I adapted to prove that KK is actually going to be KL theory of this trace cone extension. So, so uh, what you are proving is that K, K and K are the same. Yes. That's extension. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, with the you know, given an amenable faithful trace, yeah, that, that's an assumption. Then K, K of A comma J omega is going to be the same as K. Mm, yeah. And, and nuke. I am going to do the weekly. Otherwise, it's but, uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not. But it's not. Uh, Mm. So KL is a quotient of KK, right? Yes. Uh, KL uh, is just going to be KK mod the closure of zero in a certain topology. Precisely. So we basically are saying that zero is uh, separated, right? Yes. It's an isolated point. Yes. Yeah. For J omega. Okay. But that's not, that's actually, it's sort of uh, finding that in the proof, I'm not going through the topology at all. I'm just using this uh, approximate versus uh, asymptotic notion, right? Yeah, but that's the, that's the closure of zero, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> but but, but uh, am I saying uh, the viewpoint I'm taking is not yeah. proving that uh, zero is an isolated point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My viewpoint is proving that given this, or oh, sorry, given this, I can actually get this right. You can do this. Can construct the family, continuous family, yeah. Yes. So given okay. a uh, continu yeah. uh, given a discrete sequence of unitaries, I can actually uh, upgrade them to an asymptotic. It doesn't quite help with UCT, does it? I'm not using this T. No, 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 I'm saying no, no, the question is UCT, right? Questions if you can avoid UCT, but you can't really. Uh, yeah, I mean, so they need to, I mean, of course, the motivating part was that I had to understand this QD obstruction, was yeah. to understand is the UCT important? Yeah. Uh, or could you do with this? Well, why is it important if it is? And uh, I mean, it's, it's considered an extremely hard problem. Yeah, no, no. So, 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 just why it's so because it does not hold for non-aminable algebras, right? Uh, so, the only assumptions I have on here, right? That's yeah. going to be uh, A is exact, separable. Uh, NOC is nuclear, right? Yeah, that's NOC weakly nuclear. nuclear. Yeah, yeah, yeah it doesn't open up. Yeah. Saying, yeah, could just as well say that A is nuclear for that. Yeah, so uh, if I don't assume nuclear, uh, the weakly nuclear. KK classes, this is dead wrong. Yeah, so. And, uh, so. Yeah, too big. yeah, yeah, you don't have sections. Yeah, okay. Yep. That was a tray, extreme tray, so what? Uh, that's an amenable trace, and it's going to be. Amenable fixed. trace, yeah, okay. Yeah, so these are the yeah, assumptions yeah. I'm going to have on A. Yeah. Yeah, so. But no UCT. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm saying so. We basically, you wanted somehow to get use this to get rid of UCT, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was at least the first step towards, you know, trying to yeah, yeah. see where my extension actually lies. Because if it lies in uh, in um, KL, I don't know. I'm, I mean, there is this result of Dalit Islands that uh, the map from KL to Hom Lambda is an almost homeomorphism. So it sort of since anything that's almost a homomorphous or group homomorphism on KL is going to be an almost homomorphism on home lambda. So maybe you could have some approximate fiddling and giving ultrapass, maybe you could glue them together. That was the idea at least. Mm. I never got that far though. No, it's just... 
I mean, I think Krishav, as you told me, had two proofs that, uh, or two ideas to remove the UCT, but he, he inadvertently sort of uh, showed that they are equivalent to the UCT regardless. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. just, this is expected to be hard, right? <laughs> uh, so, it's just, uh, what shall we say? Basically, nobody has an idea what to do with it. Yeah. No, no, so, I mean, yes, so. it might just be easier to prove that nuclearity implies UCT or that it doesn't work, right? <laughs> yeah, precisely. Well, whichever way you, you do it, right? It's still the same problem. But I mean, another reason why this KK scale for trace code extension is important or could be important is that um, what Chris, Jamie, Stuart, and a bunch of others are trying to do is do Chris's proof, but for set stable C star plus instead with the same techniques. And they have to go through total K through to do that and do the lifting. For Z stable instead of uh... Uh, Q stable, yes. Okay. Okay, goody. Coffee break. Yep. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope that's fine that we are recording like um, this this um, this talk. You should have asked, by the way. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm asking. Uh, aren't you technically supposed to ask me before recording? <laughs> before. Before we start. <laughs> so, I think that's exactly. I think that's the more standard. <laughs> so since since we didn't like I didn't want to to hold you up like anymore. Uh -huh. So I so I hope that's is it fine for everybody if we're doing a recording now? Like uh, like uh, just tell us oh. if uh, if you have any concerns. I mean, I'm fine with it. I'm fine. Okay. And um, also sorry for the for the del for the late start of the of the talk. And uh, hope that's fine with you. And it still matches up with the time. You know, the second part's a bit shorter anyway. I think. I think. <laughs> And uh, also, before we start, uh, our second half, uh, would you like to have a short introduction? Uh, like, okay, saying like, uh, Mika, this is Mika Munkholm. I, I think you should have done that maybe 40 minutes ago, if it worked to me. It went all the right. <laughs> By the way, this is Mikkel. <laughs> he has been speaking for 40 minutes, <laughs> if you didn't notice. So what are you working on right uh, currently? What are you working on? Like, do you have some small uh, I don't know, problems that you're working on right now? I mean, right now I'm just typing or wrapping up notes about all this for uh, Stuart. Um, mm -hmm. What I tried to really, really hard trying to do was, um, I'm not really working with Q and R, but I'm actually working with something that looks like Q some Q stable C start with a bunch of assumptions. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was replace Q stable with set stable. That's very annoying hard because I mean, one thing I hate about set is it's projection list. So I don't kind of bit matrix algebra and do amplification tricks and such. So I've started to sort of really, really hate the Shansu algebra. <laughs> well, not hate it, but I'm really annoyed about it. generally like, I'm like, isn't like the whole classification of simple blah 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 simple as C star was like based on that stable, that stable C star? Yes, and that's why I wanted to extend this theorem to well, the KK scale. I want to extend it to set stable guys, but uh, I couldn't do it with exactly the same tricks. Basically, because the Shanks two algebra is projectionless, that's one of the big hurdles. And also, absorbing and being set stable doesn't give me real rank zero, which was also a hurdle. 
So. Mm. I mean, think being Q stable is extremely strong. So, so you say that you will be like for the for the second half of the talk, you, know, you will be working. On I'll, I'll do the sketch proof of what I did. Yes, with Q sketching. Yes, and doing the whole destabilization. So okay, I see. So Q was uh, UHF or what? U yeah, that's the University of Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah and, and being Q stable is about as strong as you can. Uh, as you can I mean, imagine. Yeah. I mean, uh, among stably financed startups in UST, being Q stable is the strongest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is the is the stably finite version of O2? Let me put mm -hmm. it that way. <laughs> is Q also KK equivalent to zero? No. No, no. It's no. no. Like rational the, numbers. Okay. Right. It's oh, K theory oh, is the oh. rational numbers, so we, it, it's actually pretty far away from being KK equivalent to zero. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. As the second part of the talk would be sort of the techniques more in depth. But I wanted to just motivate and tell people why mm -hmm. all these things have been done. <laughs> yeah, I think it's nice to see like uh, to see like these uh, things like um, hands on, like because you know, like usually, like in, in talks uh, on this topic, like. You see, rather like a, like an introduct introduction, like but maybe not everybody is yeah really into the topic. I mean, I can't really cover everything in detail, right? I have to. I mean, there's a particular terminology I'm a bit afraid to say in these times, but let's see what happens. <laughs> Big word. Well, I don't know if it's okay to say the Corona factorization property these days, but <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, Miguel, do you remember what uh, Manuilov and uh, Klaus did? So they have this exercise going from, uh, basically it's going from uh, actually the, going from this approximate to asymptotic approximate equivalence to asymptotic equivalence. Do you mean in their algebraic K theory paper? Oh. I'm, not, I'm not sure where, but I know that they spent a lot and lot of time precisely trying to do something like this. Yes. To replace the asympt uh, approximate by asymptotic. Yes. And I mean, and these proofs are very difficult in general, right? I mean, because, so, mm -hmm. I mean, being asymptotic is something that's, I mean, if you just look at the Kishberg Phillips theorem and all the jargon they do to get these asymptotic behaviors with unitaries, is a lot of work, mm. right? Just to, and it really uses, you know, strongly self-absorption of O2 and all these things. So something that shouldn't come for free at least. No, it doesn't come for free, of course not. No, I'm just trying to remember what they did because they worked a lot. Uh, oh. I mean, I haven't read that paper, so I don't know what they did. Right. Yeah, okay, so you don't. No, because they work a lot, a lot. It actually comes from, uh, actually, to a degree comes from Bamcom, right? Because uh, you can, it's kind of easier to construct as uh, approximate morphisms. Mm. But you want to construct, a, you want to make out of it an as asymptotic morphism so you can construct a map on K theory. It's, it's some, something oh, of this type. Okay. So somewhat go through E theory or? <sighs> Well, you try to build an E theory element, it sounds like. Yeah, basically, you build, uh, it's basically that you try to build an element of E theory. Yeah. But then, if A is nuclear, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just as good. Up to suspending, yeah. at least, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just. No, 
Now I don't remember what they did, but if we're doing precisely this kind of stuff in a bit different context. Yeah, but I mean, um, yeah. I mean, the reason why more of that is it should work here is um, in ultra powers being approximately the same as being unitary equivalent mm. after indexing. So yeah, 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 yeah. So, and actually, that's what I proved that. Unitary equivalence doesn't re definitely it gives me asymptotic behavior. <laughs> so. so you mean that the unitary equivalence and ultra power? Yes, that's how. Uh, asymptotic equivalence. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. so I just re-index to get one unitary witnessing it, and that will imply asymptotic. So, but then you use very much that you have this UHF, right? So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using these UHF stability yeah. uh, things to even get there. Because I mean, remember when I get my equivalence, I, I have to have this stupid gamma summons I have to remove. Mm -hmm. And UHF stability sort of removes that by sort of putting it, putting it into a very large matrix algebra. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's sort of the, uh, I'll get to that, but that's sort of the, how that enters at least. So what do you think? Shall we shall we resume? Like people are back. I think people are. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I guess. All right. Um, I'll. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Okay. I'm still there. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So I'll continue. I can't hear anything. Yeah, me neither. I wasn't sure like if my internet connection broke, but you can hear it, Kang. Okay. Um, yeah, I can hear. But I'm not a speaker, not a Mikkel. No, we can't hear Mikkel. Mikkel froze. I think Mikkel's internet is down. Okay, so you, you can't hear Mikkel? Like, no. Okay, so maybe I think he, maybe like he just comes in again, like uh, if the connection yeah. broke by his for whatever reason, like uh, yeah. Let's wait. He's gone. Mm -hmm. He's gone from the yeah. Okay, <clears throat> speaker is gone. Let's see. So Alex, where you stay in Copenhagen? That's just... uh, I'm, I'm in right now with my wife, but not in Copenhagen. Uh, in Germany? Yes. <laughs> I see. What happened? So, but uh, Mika, he came back. Uh, so what happened? Did uh, I just go off? We don't know, like, uh, suddenly, like, uh, we couldn't hear you. Oh. Um, but I think it should be fine now. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. 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 People can hear me and see things and... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Weird. I don't know. Just sort of yes. caught me out of Zoom. I don't know. All right. Uh, what the... So, yes. Think yourself of having this situation here. Gamma is for nuclear. And the lower one, the extension. Let me just really emphasize on this. It's separable. That's important. And then I have two conditions um, for my extension. I need J to be a stable system algebra. That's the big demanding condition here. And then there is this uh, maybe not so good word right now, but let's just say it. And I need J to satisfy the corona factorization property, um, which is a very mild condition. So that's almost automatic, this one for virtually most nicest algebras out there. But this stability thing here, that's the big assumption because J sub omega is not going to be stable generally. So J sub omega, not stable. 
But I mean, this trace cone extension that I'm starting with um, this one here, which I am going to study the X or KK theory of and KL theory, this isn't a separable extension. It's not even sigma unital. This one is not sigma unital either. So there are, this is why I'm using this notion to sort of try to push this extension backwards to something that looks like this and is separable. And where I can arrange J to be stable, that's the goal. And why this notion enters at all. So I call such a diagram or a pair, beta, my extension, and gamma, my, new, my map here, I call them immiscible in the lack of a better word. And the reason why I am after this stability and corona factorization property uh, jargon is given that my gamma here will be nuclear absorbing. As an element, as a representation from A into M. Well, here, yeah, just a few. 10 to the complex. And how do you access this nuclear absorption? You use the most general form of Wojcicki, which is the Elia Kusarovsky theorem. And the words you need to keep track of is stable, corona factorization property, and fullness. These three together give nuclear absorption. So that's what an immiscible pair is. And basically, what I want to do is reduce the situation to this sort of diagram. Okay. So here's the idea using that destabilization trick I told before. I want to prove that KL of nuke is the same as KK of nuke for my trace cone extension where A is separable exact and has some faithful amenable trace. So let me just give you the broad strokes now, what the steps we need to talk about. First step is, how do I do this? Well, in KK theory, equality amounts to asymptotic behavior. In KL theory, it is approximate behavior. So what I need to show is, given an approximate behavior, plus this, some nuclear absorbent guy, I pick whichever I choose, I need to prove that it happens asymptotically too. Is that a question, Chad? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so that's what we need to do to prove this. So how do I go about that? Well, of course, the idea is, given our approximate, approximate neutral equivalence, given that I'm actually working in an ultra power, I could re-index and make it an honest unitary equivalence, right? Unitary equivalence will imply a syntotic unitary equivalence, of course. There was just one issue here, and the reason why I need to do this admissible pair thing is I have this stupid pesky gamma summon, right? And this gamma summon maps into the multiple algebra of something that of J tensor the compacts. So I have I can't just re-index on the nose there after adding gamma. I need more control of my maps from side. I need to land in Q omega, not in some multiple algebra of a stabilization. Hence the name destabilization. So the whole idea is try to move gamma from this picture before re-indexing. And in total, I have three issues I need to deal with. First of all, the trace cone extension is not separable. So I can't access this area Kosorowski theorem from before and get new absorption. I need to arrange separability first. I need to tell you how I built my map gamma to begin with this nuclear absorbing guy. I need to build that. And I need to tell you why I can control the images of phi and psi before re-indexing. So that's the th three steps one needs to go through to do this KK is the same as KL theory. Okay, so let's try to do it step by step. First of all, let me just tell you the, the, the big step first and the most important one. For some instance, I've called it instead of beta. That's of course a beta up here. That's a beta. Okay, so here's the idea. Given that it's such an immiscible extension, or miscible pair, sorry, meaning gamma is full nuclear and uh, J here is stable and has the corona fixation property, and this whole thing is separable, with A being exact. Then I can define this set here that I'm calling F of, should again be a beta, this is an old habit, 
um, I'm calling this f of the pair set. It consists of all star morphisms from A into Q. So just any star morphism from A into Q here. And it has to agree with gamma after applying this pi map here. So how should you think of this condition? Well, you should think if I'm actually working with Q omega and R omega here, then I'm having pi sub omega here and pi sub omega is trace preserving. So this condition is basically same as saying that tau of, so this is the trace on here, it's the same as the trace on gamma. That's the analog or the generalization. So basically this condition is just trace preservation. Okay. And the point is, given a miscible extension, I get gamma to be nuclear absorbing. That's one benefit. The second benefit is if I have a Kuhn's pair from A to J, then the image of phi here is actually containing Q and not in some multiple algebra of J. And of course, why is that? That's simply just because, uh, well, phi is the same as phi minus gamma plus gamma. Gamma hits Q. This one is in J because they are in a Kuhn's pair. Okay. And conversely, if I have a nuclear map in this uh, F set here, then this in actually induces a Kuhn's pair from A into J omega. Y and J omega, well, that's this condition, right? They agree modulo the trace kernel. Okay. And now I am ready to go and connect this to KK theory, because if I now define N to be, or N app to be the approximate equivalence classes of these guys here, um, not stabilizing just approximate unitary equivalence and I write AS for the asymptotic version over here. Then I've defined two new, at least semi groups by now. And the whole, it won't work. Come on. There. And let me just tell you why that's going to be important. So these two sets, I'm going to connect them to KK and KL theory to sort of tell you how this destabilization works with an inadmissible pair. And here's what, how nuclear absorption helps me. So gamma, that gamma map from A into Q was going to be nuclear absorbing. And there is a general fact from KK theory that the KK nuclear of AJ is going to be all pairs of this form. So essentially, normally you would have pairs that look like this, right? Pairs like this. But if you have a nuclear absorbing guy, you can just fix the second variable and just pick gamma there. And the same equivalence, of course, works for KL theory. Instead, you just take approximate version instead. Otherwise, the same thing. What this actually allows me to do is define a bunch of maps and connect KK theory to this N app and N S set. So I have a big box here. And the point is, um, given this up here, I can define maps alpha and beta from this, these n sets into kk, respectively kl sets. Uh, namely, I just take a, well, for the one up here, I just take a class of star morphisms from, or representative from here, and I just map it into phi comma gamma. And by our previous ideas, this is well-defined, and it's the aim interjections automatically. So basically, I have two projections up here, so let me just make a double arrow here. Of course, asymptotic is stronger than approximate, so I get a canonical quotient map here, and I have a canonical quotient map here, and this diagram can be used by construction. So, and the whole point is, in these n sets, the equivalence is without adding the gamma summand, right? So two or phi uh, is equal to psi in here, if and only if they are actually approximate or asymptotic equivalent. 
without having to add this gamma summit. So in general, what I would like to do is I would like to, um, I need to prove this is an injection. It is always subjective to prove KK is the same scale. But instead of doing this, I would like this to be injective because if I could now have these two guys to be by ejections, then by commutativity, injectivity of this guy will imply injectivity of theta here. And that would be done. So that's the strategy of the proof. And of course it happens, so it happens that alpha and beta will be by ejections when uh, my Q's here are going to be still really nice. For instance, if it's going to be Q. Or generally you could say Q stable or UGF stable. So that's the general idea of the proof. Uh, build or reduce to a separable case, build these N sets here, prove my delta map here is injective, which will imply the feed is injective, and I'm done. So this is the whole destabilization trick or approach that I'm, I've been adapting using this admissible pair notion. Okay. So, so I've just told you how to destabilize modulo arranging separability and modulo even having this gamma nuclear absorbing guy to begin with. I need my gamma. So next I'll tell you how you build gamma and ensure it even exists at all. But try to remember this picture here as well. Otherwise we'll just go back to it. Of course, gamma, that will come from the amenability of my trace. And rather, it will come from cross diagonality of the trace. Because if I have a, um, so here's the idea. If I have a map from A into Q omega and it's trace preserving, then by something called strict comparison on Q, it will be full. So it's a tracial here. Okay, that's, that's sort of a, that's something on black box in here, but because Q is so nice, you can actually prove that gamma will be full automatically given trace preservation here. And of course, this is what cross diagonality gives me. It gives me a star motion from A into Q omega, which recovers the trace. Now the point problem is just in my standing assumptions, my trace is amenable and not cross diagonal. So from the first get go, I'm only having into R upper omega and not Q omega. So how do I, so the question is now, how do I reduce the situation from a an amenable trace to a cross diagonal trace? And there is a nice trick. And the trick is the following. We're given this gamma zero map from main top omega, which will cause the trace. And there's a theme due to, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name, Carrion, Carrion. And White and Nathaniel Brown. I think, I think there's an X. Carrion. Carrion, okay. Yeah, it's Spanish actually, or Mexican. Okay. Carrion. And I think there's also an X on board. Yeah, there, yeah. Okay. Or it's just like uh, small caps automatic. Maybe. Okay, Bakarion. Thank you. Um, anyway, what I proved is if you take a separable cyst algebra, then every amenable trace on the cone is cross diagonal. Of course, this is no issue to me because I'm doing KK theory and going to a cone and suspensions, that doesn't matter to me. That's just a change in index. Right? So I take my amenable trace. I upgrade it to a cross diagonal trace on the double suspension. I just do this trick twice. Suddenly I have a QD trace. And of course the point is that KK is the same as the double suspension in the first variable. So without loss of generality, we can and may assume that tau is cross diagonal to begin with. I just have to upgrade my map twice. That's a nice little trick. And um, yes, so instead of having a amenable trace, let's just assume we have a map A into Q omega, which is now going to be full. That would be the gamma map from before. So uh, can, I, can I ask that question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, so do you mean like uh, that you have like, you start off with some trace 
Yeah, I start with an amendment trace, right? So I start with this. Mm -hmm. And I upgrade it to Tor Prime on, well, if I go to the cone, mm -hmm. by just tensing with the, the back trace. Mm -hmm. I just restrict it to the suspension. Now I have a cross diagonal trace. So like, so like uh, you get a trace from the cone of A or the second cone of A yeah. uh, to R upper omega? Like, sorry, you get a, you get a, um, yeah, so basically what I would have is I would have a map from S. So after going to this double suspension, right, I would have a map like this. But in KK theory, there is no issue, right, because it's just a change in index. So you get it first, like, uh, for C to A goes to R omega, like a star homomorph, uh, and then back. No, Q omega, Q omega. I'm, I'm operating to a cross diagonal one using this theorem. Yes, yes. So, so first, like you say, okay, um, am amenable. Um, you, yes, you amenable gives me this gamma zero here. Given that, if I tensor with the, uh, if I put it into my cone by tensoring with the back trace, it will be cross diagonal automatically. So it lifts to Q omega. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, after going to the cone and uh, after, if I do this twice, just, then I actually don't change anything in K theory or KK theory, sorry. So that's just a trick to an upgrade my amenable trace modulo KK theory, I guess. So a bot periodicity comes to my rescue, I guess. So that's how you build gamma. Uh, so remember, now I have gamma. I need to get an admissible pair that diagram of a map. And the problem is it needs separability to do this. And this is where you need something that's called separability inheritability. So remember, I need to prove that um, this map is injective. And to do so, you, we have arranged that we have a cross diagonal trace, uh, gamma from A into Q low one, from before. And it's going to be full. And having done this, we now produce a diagram, which is large and crazy. Okay, so here's the point. You use something called, there's an older notion, that's called so be inheritability. Let me just tell you what one achieves with it first. We start with this, right? And our map A into Q omega. That's what we start with. Now what one does is one sort of pulls the extension back to some sub extension here where this extension is separable and where j is still stable has the corner factor station property and where this map gamma here actually co-restricts to a full map gamma zero and um, so in other words I take my original trace cone extension, I pull everything back, and I obtain my admissible pair, right? Namely, this eta zero comma gamma zero map. And of course, this very fitly, these sort of uh, pushing properties and such back by separability. Um, in Chris's AF embedding paper, he has the first four pages, just a bunch of them as ensuring all these things can be arranged, but they are not too difficult. Uh, so most quantifiable properties can be pushed back in this way. Things like building zero, stable rank one. Uh, if you need a bunch of unitaries to belong to Q, you could do that. Uh, nuclearity can be arranged. So most quantifiable properties can be pushed back in this way. Okay, so now, we, uh, now we've got some game going on, right? Now I have my admissible pair and I can do that and I just have proved my delta map was actually injective. So I've just rewritten the situation now. So I've pushed my whole thing back and the other part here is my admissible pair, right? Okay. So this, since this is an admissible pair, this map in as to n app is going to be injective by nuclear absorption and all this, I can build these sets. And it is going to be injective because, well, I'm assuming approximate unitary equivalence, right? 
here. Uh, but I'm in an ultra power, right? So I can just re index and make it unitary equivalence. That implies a symptotic unitary equivalence, right? So um, I need to prove this implies this. I'm actually proving that, well, this can be re indexed to an honest unitary equivalence. So in particular, I obtained this. And I'm done. That's basically a proof. Of course, there are a lot of details and such to be covered extra, but that's the idea of the proof. You build your gamma from getting a cross diagonal trace first after having done the, done the trick. You arrange the probability, keep track of the corona factorization property, stability of J, and then you can do this destabilization trick. And uh, that's and then you get the isomorphism from KK to KL theory. Mm -hmm. okay. Of course, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a bit here with a few things because, I mean, J omega is not sigma unital, so I should have told that KK theory then is an inductive limiter for all separable sub address and second variable and these things, but more the, these are the main points of the proof. Right. So, uh, uh, do you need a product at any point in this proof? A product, sorry. Do you need a, Do you need that? Uh, you have a product available. I mean, like you mean the Kasparov product, or because um, I'm not sure. Like, do you need a product at any point in the proof? Because then you could just define like these groups to be this. What you define like KL, KK nu. Uh, what do you mean a Kasparov product here? What do you mean by product? Okay. Um, do I use it even implicitly? No, but the Elie Kosorowski theorem really demands separability. So okay. That's why I'm definitely using that bit to get new clubs option. Or at least sigma unitality is what I need. Um, but no, I don't think I'm using a Kaspar plug at any point. I have to be really careful here. They usually do them implicitly somewhere. <laughs> um, I don't think so, no. No, the reason why I need separability and sigma unitality, more precisely, is actually just to um, access the electrus Roski theorem. Mm. And, and I mean, the data Eilers characterization of um, that KK theory is this module, these equivalences, it requires separability and sigma unitality too. So. But that whole, that, that's uh, with these, um J0, Q0, R0? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So then it'd be fine. Because I mean, generally, um, so generally, if I, uh, yeah, so the KK theory of the low one here, right? Or KK of A, just ignoring the J nuke here. Because J omega is not sigma unital, even, this is going to be an inductive limit. Of you mean KKA like, of all separable J lambdas. Uh, like, but you mean if it's continuous? I mean, like, Richard, I think you told me one time that uh, one has to be careful that uh, if one defines like KK theory in some sense. Yeah, but the other way, so it's it's A, it's not J. So if J can be non non separable. We don't care. But That's I mean, like, fine. That you can pull out like I mean, like that you can pull out the inductive limit. So if you know that J. Oh yeah, I'm, but I'm not. I'm not using continuity here. No. No, 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 there's no, 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 there's nothing special happening here. But, but it's not a problem, not that the KKAJ is fine whether J is uh, separable or not. Separability is a pro question, the first variable. KK. Yeah. Right, that, that's, that's no problem here. No problem is this uh, corona factorization thing. Um, well, I mean, the corona factorization property, I mean, it doesn't hold for J omega on the nose. But mm -hmm. once I push back to separability here, I can arrange it and also arrange a stable or stability. Sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, no, but yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that's where you have to where you have to go to separable things. Yes. I so, have yeah. a question. For the periodicity, do we need a separable cis-algebra? For what? Sorry. Uh, for the periodicity, do we need the cis-algebra to be separable? No. For stability? No. Uh, no. But the way you prove that it's going to be stable access some separability 
No, but there's another problem. I'm like, if you, I'm like, so. I don't I'm know. Like, Maybe you have a different it, it, proof. I'm like the, the Someone problem. use the product using yeah. the catalog product, then you may have a trouble. Yeah, there's there's another problem that you know, like that you prove that um, that KK theory, uh, like the way it's built is like as a split exact something universal, blah blah. Uh, but what you need for bot periodicity is like half exactness. And I think there comes in like... Um, I, I think know. they also should separable. I think they, as you said, half exact homotopy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, needed on the separable C stagible as a category. That, yeah, so that that's, that's uses like that. I think that uses like that uh, you, you're working on separable C stagible. Because like the way you build these Kunz pairs is nothing but building in a concrete way the universe is split exact. Yeah, but uh, but there are, I think there are many ways to prove this for the periodicity. So maybe there are way you can avoid separability. Yeah, but what periodicity you, you use, like you have a half exact country. Like the Kunz proof, I think, uses that you have a half exact country. Yeah, but I ask whether you need the separable. No, yeah, you don't need the separable, but you need a half exact one. So okay. if you know that you have a half exact, then you're fine. But you don't know if we have a half exact one uh, for the. Do, do I have a half exact for now? Separable system. Like if KK nook is half exact. Okay. The nook itself makes it half exact, right? Okay, I, I don't know. I just I never working on non-separable system. No, no, yeah. no. You just think this KK nook just just means that all the maps you have a. Uh, have splittings, completely positive splitting. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So if... so you, you tell me that using KK look to prove for the periodicity, is that what you mean? No, no, I'm saying that holds, right? No, no, both periodicity is not that, uh, what's the word? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both periodicity, but it's both periodicity, uh, no, no, the whole thing is uh, both periodicity in the sense that's coming here is not a problem. So half, you know, as you know that, so we know that it's half exact for as for semi-split exact sequences. We don't uh, separate hey, sorry, no, 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 guys, no. So what, what you do, you, you replace the algebra by second, uh, second suspension, right? Yeah, yeah, that is what I want to, yeah. K0 is equal to a K2 for C star algebra. A, do we need A to be separable or same sigma unital or any C star algebra? Do you mean K theory or KK theory? K theory, for the no, K theory. No, no, no. K, so, Kank, K theory couldn't care less whether it's separable or not. Okay. For K theory is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I never, I never look at the non-separable system. No, no. For for KT is irrelevant. Yeah. For KK, it's it's a bit different. Okay. But say it's invariant under second suspension. Still. Okay. Remember, it's KK a comma j. Okay. As I said, it behaves nicely in the second variable. So the okay. first variable is separable. You don't care. Okay. And anyway, product is the product with its, uh, its exterior Casper of product. The okay. pot periodicity is exterior Casper of product. There's no problem of separability there. Do you have a reference for this? In the literature? I think, I think you should sit down and check, right? Casper of, right? <laughs> Casper of maybe, prospectus. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Kunz's uh, paper, not like not the not the two paper, but like the one with the analytic uh, K theory boundary maps and. Uh, okay. I don't even know it, uh, but uh, but it is in Kasparov. In Kasparov's conspectus. Okay. But uh, so no, so the exterior product is easy. Exterior Kasparov product is easy. And that's all you need for both periodicity. The product you need, uh, if you need the product, you need uh, uh, one variable to hey. be separable, another to be sigma unit. Uh, no, no, no. Exterior. No. Exterior product. That's different. Okay. 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 That's quite different. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Okay, I see. I see what you mean now. The, the Casper standard Casper product is completely different story, but that's the tensor product. You are tensoring with with R two. <laughs> They're taking your KK element. You are tensoring with, with R two. There is no problem there. Maybe we can make a interlimit uh, version of a Casper product. Like you can, like you can make a, like an infinite homotopy, something like that. Uh, I guess you can write like a uh, uh, index limit of separable uh, C star algebras. Then you make like a infinite homotopy and a final homotopy, something like this. Yeah, you can do that. Well, I, I guess you can. No. Uh, I guess but, I did uh, not check it. I mean, so when the separable, when the C star to be separable, infinite homotopy can be one homotopy, something mm -hmm. like this. Anyway, I, I think such thing is happening in the E theory. That's what uh, Nigel Hickson did. In this uh, notes, this uh, memoir, yeah. MAs, he did for non separable system algebra. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Anyway, so, the, here there's no problem. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not using. Okay. Well, you're using both periodicity, which is really a product, right? <laughs> But it's exterior product. No, why nice I ask product. because Mika said he wanted to go to double suspension or double cone or something like this. So sure. that's why I ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is used here, right? Yeah, but but it's used as a, in an easy case where you don't really care about separability or anything. <sighs> yeah. So thank you, Mika. Very nice talk. Yep. Mm -hmm. And make it like uh, thank you. So thank you very much. No, no, no. I think uh, I think Mika. Um... Yeah, I think he has problems again. He's yep. good again. <laughs> oh, he's frozen out again. <laughs> <Yeah>. see, again. <laughs> okay. Where he is now? Where is he now? In the UK? At home, I think. Oh, he's UK. No, I think he's he... back at home. Yeah, he's uh, in Copenhagen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. I'm afraid I have to do something else. But uh, thanks a lot. I think there was still, and I think there was and still we... one slide he had. Hmm? Like was, I think there was still one slide he had. Like uh, <laughs> I think there was twenty from twenty-two. So, Mika, you're back. Okay, he's back now. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> you're muted. Uh, my internet is uh, triggering me. I don't know. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Are you done? Uh, I have one slide. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just need to share. Right. So I just want to pinpoint some generalizations because I implicitly work with the uh, Q omega R over omega extension, right? You don't need to do that. You can take A to B as before and uh, B to be in a unital UGF stable, stable exactly yeah. start bar, same both unique ways. So it looks like Q, but it need not be Q. <laughs> mm. Looks like Q, walks like Q, but isn't yeah. necessarily mm. Q, basically, and it still works. And then the corollary, or the thing I showed before is actually a side product. Yeah. And so, uh, I expect one could replace UHF stability by set stability. Because I know that Jamie and Chris have proved a destabilization theorem, and I, what I showed you, for set stable systems. And I believe that could be adapted mm -hmm. to so far. It seems reasonable at least. But I still have some issues, namely that um, the reason why UHF stable gives me this corona factorization property and stability is absorbing UHF as UHF stable, well, absorbing a UHF algebra gives me really zero. And this is dead wrong for set stable C star algebras, mm -hmm. given that it's projectionless. So there's some, but I, from what we've been told by Chris, he believes one could go through the Kuhn semi group and do some stuff there instead. But I'm not sure how to do that. Okay. Yep, so that's just the generalizations I wanted to pinpoint and uh, questions. <laughs> So I already had questions. Yeah. So More questions. 
Um, thanks, Mika, for the very nice talk. You're welcome. Um, How do you do that? Uh, can we do something like this? You have, if you have Jiangsu algebra, you can write as a continuous field of system algebra, such as every fiber is a, is a UHF. Can you use this trick? Oh, I don't know, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not too familiar about continuous fields and all that, so. Okay, so you have to look at Mike and uh, and uh, Van Hans paper called the Jiangsu algebra revised. Something like this. Yeah, the one with him. Yes. Yeah, so I think they write the Jiangsu algebra as a continuous field of, of a system algebra such that every fiber is a, a, a UHA algebra. Okay. In fact, two infinity, three infinity type. Hey, but, but what do you mean continuous field? It's simple. So what does uh, mean continuous field? They are simple. It's simple. Shang Tsui algebra is simple. Yes. So, so what does? Oh yeah, yeah. Hohe Hohe helped me. Is induction limit up to induction limit? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Of course. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. 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 Yeah, induction limit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Induction limit. Yeah. So maybe you have the other path to induction limit. Then you can assume it's a continuous field. Then you have to deal with deduce your theorem from the fiber C algebra to the bundle C algebra. Mm. I, it's not continuous field, right? It's a direct limit of finite matrices, finite direct limit of the R circles, right? Uh, no, that's a direct limit of this prime dimension drop. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's over the, I think the base space is a unit interval, I think. So one dimensional, yeah. But not so. I don't know. <laughs> okay, guys, sorry, I have to stop for now. Miguel, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. It was very nice. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. so we, we just, just one thing, so we uh, make a summer break now, right? But we you get, yeah, so, but you get some kind of email and information about what we do. We will continue in the uh, fall semester, maybe in a bit more uh, broad context. We'll take a look some other places. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. See you yes, guys. Thank you. Have, a, See you. have a nice summer. Have a nice summer. Yeah. You nice too. Have a nice summer. Hi. Sure. <laughs> so Mika, where you are now? You are in Copenhagen. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So so you are a PhD student in with a Stuart in Oxford. No, I'm a high school teacher. You are a high school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what do you teach the high school students? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently too much. <laughs> too much <laughs> i mean i mean things i should how, never how, tell how, them how do you how do you